Hi, David. Norlan, how are you today? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Okay, so we discussed um, Russia after uh, Cold War. We discussed, uh, obviously, war in Ukraine. But we didn't discuss NATO, that Mr. Putin says that was the, one of the threats why he started all this. NATO was established in uh, 1949 as a kind of answer to uh, Soviet threat, right? In 1991, uh, Soviet Union um, collapsed. But we see that NATO carried on, like NATO, you know, didn't uh, cease to exist. It's, it, it was still around and it even became bigger. So why that happened? Why there was a need for NATO after the Soviet Union? It's an interesting question. I, I remember a lot of the debates that happened in the early 90s about what to, I mean, what to do about NATO. That was a huge talking point within a lot of, within a lot of groups a lot of foreign policy discussions surrounding that. No one wanted to dissolve NATO um, simply because it was this association that was there. Momentum has a lot of things to do with the reason that it kept going, um, but it did spend the first few years of the immediate post-Cold War doing a lot of soul searching, searching for meaning, searching for purpose. I think influenced a lot of the decisions that that started to happen later in the, as the 90s continued, with operations in Bosnia, in Kosovo, and sort of into the, the 2000s and, uh, and beyond into, into the modern stage and the modern era. NATO itself is absolutely is, is, a, is a defensive alliance. There's a lot of articles, there's more to it though. There's a lot of articles within the, the NATO charter that in addition to Article 5, which is sort of that for, through the Cold War period, Article 5, was absolutely this, this key article that, you know, if, if one of the nations was attacked, it could call on other NATO members who would be obliged to provide assistance. There are other articles, however, that call for cooperation. There's, there's even some economic articles that were put in there by the Canadians, actually, um, in terms of uh, trying to, that could feasibly, theoretically, use NATO as more of an, as an economic union. Um, to assist with economic issues and whatnot. And a lot of that was all sort of being talked about and bandied around in the, the early 90s before, before the Bosnia operation, which I'm, uh, I have absolutely no doubt as part of this conversation, you're going to be asking me a couple of questions about. Of course I will. But, uh, but that's momentum, I think, sort of kept, kept things going. It's a, a, a victorious, quote unquote, victorious alliance at the end of the, end of the Cold War, where they're, you want to say that NATO won the Cold War, the United States won the Cold War, or, I mean, I have a, I have a fantastic analogy that I've been saving for a later time, but for those of you who are going to bother to watch this, which hopefully is all of you out there, but uh, it's sort of the idea in, in a boxing match, if one of, the, uh, one of the fighters drops dead of a heart attack, does the guy still standing, does he really still count as the winner? Because... I mean, yeah, he's the only I one. Guess it will. He's the only one standing, but he didn't really necessarily like beat the other guy in a fight. Um, but I mean, momentum has a lot to do with that. It's the victorious alliance. It there was lots of good relationship building that happened in the West um, as a result of the, the NATO alliance from '49 to '91, and trying to leverage that and use that as continued as a continued piece of leverage and influence. Um, certainly was a lot of talk in the early 90s. NATO was formed as a collective security pact in 1949 with a primary purpose to defend its members from possible threats. And just like in 1949, in 2022, information security is critical, which is why I am so glad to be working with the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. NordVPN is a multiple award-winning service and offers the fastest VPN speeds out there by letting you connect to more than 5,400 super fast servers in 60 countries. NordVPN not only lets you route your traffic through two VPN servers for extra protection, but also has an automatic kill switch so that if the VPN connection accidentally drops, it blocks your device's connection for maximum security. And with one-click connections, or even auto-connect, it's super easy to use. NordVPN is also super customer-friendly with 24-7 customer support and supports six simultaneous connections on all your devices, no matter if you're using Mac OS, Linux, iOS, Android, Windows, and even Android TV 
I use NordVPN when I'm traveling so that I can stream my favorite movies no matter where I am. NordVPN is offering our viewers an exclusive deal. Sign up for NordVPN's two-year plan and get a full extra month for free by going to nordvpn.com slash the Cold War. We see that NATO wasn't involved to any military campaign or operation during the Cold War. And uh, after Soviet Union collapsed and we saw NATO all over the place. We saw NATO in uh, Bosnian War. We saw NATO in Kosovo. Uh, we saw NATO in 2000s, we saw in the Middle East, even in Libya, we saw NATO. So why NATO wasn't involved in any military campaign during the Cold War era? Was they afraid of Soviet Union so much and they neglected the Russia after the uh, Cold War? Because I remember that when, um, during the Kosovo 1999, uh, when NATO was bombing Serbia, um, Russia was against it. I remember in Gostuma, you know, people just wear the military um, military attire. They went there and said that, hey, we don't want this. We don't want NATO bombing uh, Serbia because I think the Russia still felt that, you know, like uh, NATO should be afraid of Russia, but they clearly wasn't. So, like, can we say that they were afraid or there's something else? I would say that during the Cold War period, NATO's formation as a as a specifically anti-Soviet alliance, was that was very much its raison d'etre. That's what it was all about. <clears throat> and it was easy to hold that, this is very much related to the first question, obviously. It's very easy to, to hold that as your, as your reason for being when your clear, the clear opponent, your enemy, is still there. When that enemy suddenly disappears and you're searching for, for meaning and a, a reason to have have a purpose, that's when you start sort of casting around and finding other ways to to be useful and to feel relevant, whether it's, I'm cautious about using the word legitimate, um, certainly in terms of the, the Bosnia case, uh, NATO, NATO involvement in Bosnia was fully sanctioned by the UN Security Council, uh, including the Russians. Um, that was, so the, the NATO involvement there, including what began as more peacekeeping then turned into more aggressive and offensive operations. That was all approved and sort of agreed to by the United Nations collectively, including the Security Council. You mentioned Kosovo. Kosovo is a rather a different story in that NATO did not have approval from the United Nations Security Council as a result of a Russian veto, Chinese veto as well, I believe, um, in terms of not, not not allowing NATO involvement. NATO took its own unanimous but unilateral step to uh, protect what I believe was Article 4 clauses in terms of humanitarian protection, as well as preventing destabilization of the region. Illegal by international law. I mean, that's, we're what, 20, 20 something years past and there's still lots of Arguments and disagreements. I, I see both both sides of it in terms of lots of lots of people saying in the West, like you know, never again, following the, the Holocaust, and we've had 50 years of never again, despite how many over and overs we've seen, um, including what we're seeing seemingly now in Ukraine. Uh, but certainly, like in terms of NATO involvement, the, the first question that you asked about purpose is very much linked to the second question about. NATO finding its purpose in looking for purpose in humanitarian action, in protecting European stability, stability of like regional stability, all of those things. After the annexation of Crimea, um, it seems like NATO is, you know, like the, they see Russia as a threat again, and they have this um, rule, you know, to spend 2% of the GDP for the uh, military, uh, for, the, for, the, for the defense. Um, so it seems like NATO is repurposing itself at this point after Crimean annexation. Do you feel the same way and that it's starting to expand more and more now with the Georgia and Ukraine, you know, like in early 2000 they got um, Baltic countries. Now, like Mr. Putin is pushing uh, Finland and Sweden, you know, like that to NATO as well, like that they're considering this. Um, do you think it's now it's about the anti-Russian 
organization like that, not anti-Russian, maybe, let me rephrase it, maybe, you know, just a threat uh, to kind of to oppose to Russia. I think after 20 years of NATO searching for purpose, um, NATO circled around and found its purpose again. Uh, the number of, and the, for some context to that, the number of Cold War era documents that I have read from US military, UK military, etc., that use Soviet Union and Russia interchangeably in official documentation is, is astounding. And it, it's glaring to me every single time. But I think that the 20 years of searching that NATO sort of put out there in terms of finding, finding its purpose, they've gone back to their original purpose. And that's that intermingling or that, that conf confusion, conflation of Russia and the Soviet Union as being one and the same. And one eggs on the other. Like NATO, NATO recognizing and seeing Russia, the Russian Federation as a threat makes Russia sort of, you know, it's obviously like, you know, gets its back up and wants to push back against that and back and forth and so on and so on and so on and so forth. But like what you've said, what it inevitably what ends up happening is that independent countries on the Russian border who have very real and vivid memories, recent memories of Soviet, being Soviet republics, being under Soviet occupation. That's certainly how the three Baltic states see their time as republics, Soviet republics, simply as being occupation after 1940, an illegal occupation after 1940. We should write that down and do an episode on that, by the way. Um, but very much, I think there's those recent memories have driven the fear of a resurgent Russia, and they're looking for protection, and they find that protection within the closest anti-Russian alliance that they can, which happens to be NATO. Does that mean that I think that one, one place is completely at fault and the other is completely blameless? No, I think this, this, this is, that's a chicken and egg question. Which comes first? I think that really depends on what side of the... I mean, a lot of people want me to say that there's a new Iron Curtain descending and it's a new Cold War, and that's a, that's a whole other... We can do a whole other interview and question, quest Q&A period on that if you want, but... That's, yeah, that sounds uh, like a good episode. Depends which side of the uh, the divide you fall on, how you want to see who's who started it, who's to quote unquote who's to blame. Uh, but certainly in terms of the the countries that are looking to either have joined in part of the NATO expansion, whether it be countries like Poland and Hungary and Romania, or countries that want to join like Ukraine, there's very specific and good historical reasons why those independent countries are seeking protections from one of their neighbors. So Mr. Putin repeatedly said that, um, that NATO is a threat for Russia. And I think in one of his interviews he said that, um, you know, he, he kind of explained why he doesn't want Ukraine to be in NATO. He said that, you know, uh, once Ukraine is in NATO, he may want to liberate or take back Crimea, and that means that uh, the Russia will fight against NATO's army. If NATO was a threat to Russia all this time, and that they were planning to attack. Um, this is the perfect opportunity, I think, you know, because all uh, Russia army is tied up in Ukraine, in East Ukraine and uh, west of Russia, uh, and the uh, Baltic countries, and that they were like, NATO was moving all the forces to the border. Like this would be perfect opportunity, but that didn't happen. So does it mean that NATO wasn't a threat for Russia? This is a difficult question to answer, or maybe not difficult, but this is, a, this is a very loaded question. Was NATO ever a threat to Russia? Not if you're NATO. If you're Russia, NATO's always been the threat. That's, I mean, 1949, as we just said, it's an alliance that was formed specifically to counter Soviet slash Russian threat to, to the West. It's, this is this is really interesting. There's a lot of I've seen a lot of debate and a lot of conversation talking 
about why the Russian Federation hasn't deployed any of its premier air assets, uh, aircraft, like its first line, new generation uh, aircraft into Ukraine, because it likely would make a pretty significant difference. And the theorization is that, well, there's two, it's either that the stuff isn't, isn't flyable and it isn't ready, or that it's being held in reserve in case of a possible NATO attack. And a lot of like the, the, the supposition is that a lot of that's been moved on to sort of onto the Polish border, um, up onto the, the Baltic, the former Baltic republics, um, in the event that NATO fulfills its purpose and attacks Russia. Do I think that NATO ever planned to attack Russia? I don't think that they ever planned an ag- a war of aggression against Russia. I don't think that that was ever really beyond maybe like the, the planning stages, which any alliance and any military will do. They will have war plans because that's what a proper military does is they plan. Beyond that, was there ever any real serious possibility of it? I personally don't think so. If someone has ev- actual evidence, not just rumor and hearsay, if anybody has any actual evidence, I mean, I'm, I'm open to, to hear about it, but it's nothing I've ever heard of. Would it be the perfect opportunity? 100% this is the perfect opportunity. We're on, what, day 51, 52 of war in Ukraine. The, Russians, the Russian army is very, very clearly, severely bogged down. Uh, they just recently lost their um, the ship. Mus- the Moskva has been converted Flash. from a, a Slavocrat class cruiser into a submarine, apparently. <laughs> this is absolutely the perfect time for any country to launch an attack on Russia, let alone NATO. We're not seeing it happen. We're not seeing mass deployments of, if we were to see a NATO attack being planned into Russia, we'd be seeing a reforger type exercise of massive airlift and sea lift of US military equipment, which would be 100% required for an attack, being seeing like that type of lift exercise being put into like places like Poland um, and into the Baltics, we're not seeing that. I don't think that I don't think that that's in the cards. I don't think that's ever been in the cards. As a first strike, if the Russian Federation decides to make moves against a NATO country, absolutely Article Five will be invoked, and then I think, well, you can bleep this out, but it's really going to hit the fan. <laughs> How do you see the future of the NATO? Because, um, I, like, from the looks of it, NATO seems more united than it used to be. Um, from the looks of it, uh, Ukraine is de facto member of NATO because they have lots of uh, weapons from NATO countries. Like even like they're like they're switching to this 115 calibers that's used in NATO only. They are getting more modern um, weapons to fight against Russia. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Scandinavian, some of the Scandinavian countries decided to join or they're still discussing, you know, before they like I, I saw the poll um, early 2000s and now um, if Finland should be part of NATO, like you can see that huge swing uh, in, in, in people's decision. Like how do you see the future of the NATO at this point? Like we don't know how war will end, obviously, what's going to happen, but, you know, do you have any... Any ideas, any thoughts on this? I have lots of ideas. I have lots of thoughts, like with almost anything that you can ask me. I don't necessarily, I don't know what the future of NATO is going to look like. It's interesting that you bring up the spending commitments and sort of the, the seeming unitary decision-making that's happening within, within NATO that we haven't seen for 20 years, certainly, I mean, 30 years almost, but certainly in the last 20. Wh- I don't know how long that's, personally, I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, There's a lot of variables that are involved there. We've spent the last 15 to 20 years watching some of the Western European NATO members, certainly not necessarily speaking in favor of Russia, but due to economic and especially like energy dependence, being very cautious in terms of how it offends Russia, just sort of being very careful, certainly to, to ma- try to maintain Russia as, if not an ally, at least certainly as someone in their good books, to make sure that energy supplies continue to flow. 
what that's going to look like in a week, in six weeks, in six months. I, I'm really not sure. I'm very curious to see if this type of unity in the Alliance right now continues. It, I mean, there's always reports and rumors that Germany is you know, paying lip service, but then not following through. And there's, there's lots of, I mean, the, the French election, um, depending if Marie Le Pen can somehow pull out a win against Macron, I mean, that, that has a, a real possibility of certainly changing a lot of things, the, the reality on the ground. I don't know what the future of NATO looks like. I can certainly see it. NATO in some form or another is going to stay, whether all the member nations within it stay, whether there's some breakaway from some of the original founders. Uh, I, I really I don't know and I couldn't say. Um, I do know that the more recent nations that have joined NATO certainly don't want NATO to go away. They are very much reliant on NATO as a as a, a hedge and a bulwark against perceived threats from uh, from Russia. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you, Nerland.